my dad said to me the day in the visiting room, he said, listen, I have to ask you one question, son. If you ever had to kill somebody, could you do it? And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, under the right circumstances, yeah, I could do it. You know, our family, the Columbos, we happen to be one of the warring families. We had three wars in my lifetime. What's it like dealing with the Russian mafia? Were you introduced by someone? I knew how to use the life to benefit me in business. You know, if you know how to do that, mm. there's benefits to it. But the biggest scheme that I got involved in was the wholesale gasoline business. And I devised a scheme with the help of another guy to defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. Defraud the government on all the petrol in America? Correct. We collected the tax, we didn't pay it. And at the height of our operation, we were doing between eight and $10 million a week. You, how much do you reckon you've earned at your peak in total? Like the whole petrol scam? We're talking hundreds of million. There was guys that say to me, Michael, you got all this money, why don't you stop? I said, why? I said, you get as much time for a million dollars as you do for a billion, so I may as well Carry keep on. going. Yeah. Is there one mobster that you had the fear of? Michael, welcome to the show, mate. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, really looking forward to it. Have you just, where have you just flown in from? Just got in from uh, Los Angeles, actually. A couple of hours ago. A couple of hours, but you know, it's, uh, normally it's 11 hours to get here. This time it was nine. Yeah. So I don't know if they took a different route. We got a good tailwind, <laughs> but it was great. Quality. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you get the name Prince of the Cosa Nostra? Well, I grew up in Brooklyn, and uh, my dad was the underboss of the Colombo family, one of the five New York Cosa Nostra families. So, you know, um, my dad was a very high-profile figure. He was always under investigation, major target of law enforcement. He was kind of like the John Gotti of his day. Yeah. So I grew up around that all the time, from the time I could remember. And uh, I actually grew up hating the police, hated law enforcement, hated the government, because I loved my dad. He was mm. my idol. And I always saw them as the enemy, mm. trying to harass my dad, harass my family. So I grew up with that kind of, you know, thinking. Uh, but my dad, he, he didn't want this life for me. He wanted me to go to school, he said, son, be a professional, stay out of the street, you know, it's better for you. And I was on that road until my dad got in some very serious trouble in the 60s. He was indicted uh, twice in the state of New York, serious crimes, grand larceny and murder. Uh, went to trial both times, was acquitted, found not guilty. But then in 66, he was indicted in federal court for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. Right, okay. And how, how old were you then in 66, I was, roughly? Uh, in 66, I was 15. 15. Yeah. What was it like for you at school at that time? You know everything's going on with your old man outside of school. Other kids must have seen what was going on. The teachers must have seen. Yeah. must have been all over the press. How was it for you? Yeah, because he had so much publicity. I mean, you, you couldn't hide it. You know, a lot of you know a lot of the guys thought it was cool, yeah. and then I had my issues in school. You know, mm -hmm. oh, you, you got a mafia dad, and I would fight. You know, yeah. we, we'd have that kind of a thing, and some of the teachers were a little bit tough on it because my dad was very visible. He, I, I was an athlete; he used to come to all my games, yeah. and uh, some of them a little standoffish, and others were fine. You know, so you had a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. You know. But, uh, you know, it was really hard. Some of the law enforcement people harassed us. You know, I remember one time we went into a restaurant. I was one of seven kids. We go into a restaurant, sit down, have a bite to eat. There's like seven of them because they had different agencies following him. They'd come in, sit in a table behind us, watch us eat. So one night, this, uh, this guy was a Nassau County detective. He passes by my table and makes a really nasty remark for my dad, loud enough for everybody to hear. My dad didn't like that. You know, you don't disrespect <laughs> his family. Yeah, yeah. He jumped up one right after the agent. The agent got scared. My dad was a tough guy. Mm. He pulls out his gun right in the middle of the restaurant. And Your you know, old man did? No, no. The, the agent. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll never forget. My father looks at him and says, go ahead. I'll drop you before you get off your first shot. Just like that. And everybody started screaming. Me and my brother jumped in between them, separated them, you know, because it was, it was going to come down. So we had incidents like that. Mm. And so, you know, you see that as a kid, and you don't like these people, mm. you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was going to school, but he gets convicted on that case, and they give him a 50-year prison sentence. A 5-0? Yeah, for masterminding this string of bank robberies. It was the longest sentence for a bank robbery conspiracy ever given up to that Jeez. point. 50 years. Was that, his, was that his first time he got banged up? Or he'd been in prison before? It was his first conviction. 
But yeah. why 50? Did they just want him off the street? They, they they yeah. Make I a mean, make a yeah. example of him. And like I said, he was kind of like the John Gotti of his day. So yeah. they were out to get him. And mm-hmm. they missed him three, you know, twice uh, on two big cases. So they, they gave him everything at one time. So uh, I was a pre-med student at Hofstra University in Long Island. And um, Joe Colombo was the boss of our family. He had started this Italian-American Civil Rights League try to help Italians with being, you know, framed by the government. Mm. So I joined that league help, looking to help my father. And uh, I went to see him in, in uh, Leavenworth Penitentiary. We were in the visitor room and I said, Dad, bank robbery. And I'll never forget, he looked at me, he said, son, I'm no bank robber. I've been framed. I'm innocent yeah, of this yeah. case. He says, and we got to prove my innocence because he was going to die in jail. Yeah. He was 50 when he went in. Figured. Oh, my God. He had 50. Yeah, it's 100, right? And was that, was that a definite you're going to be in there for the whole 50? It wasn't like you're going to do half or anything like that? Well, it, it depends. Now, I'll tell you the other part of the story. No, he could have made parole. Yeah. And he actually did make parole and violated parole five times. So he was in and out five times, but he ended up doing 40 years on the 50. 40 Jesus. on the 50. But um, when I saw him, I said, Dad, you're going to die in here if I don't help you out. No, you got to go to school. I said, forget it. I'm not going to school. And um, it was at a meeting at Leavenworth in the visiting room when he proposed me for membership in a life. He said, hey, you're going to be on the street. You're my son. You're going to do it the right way. Yeah. And he proposed me for membership. And that's how it started for me. I was 19. No, just turning 20. So you, you, you left university to say, right, I want to go with yeah. the Colombo family now. You know, it wasn't so much that I wanted to go to that family. I said, Dad, we need money. Because, you know, there's this big myth on the street. You know, a guy goes away and the mob helps him and pays for him. No. No, okay. My dad had some money on the street, but when it ran out, that was it. Yeah. You know, and I was the oldest, younger brother and sister. I had to provide for them and the family. So I said, Dad, I got to do something here. Going to school, that ain't going to work. So he said, okay, but then I want you as part of my life. Yeah. It wasn't that I said, I want to be part of yeah. your life. He said, this is what I want. Do yeah. it the right way. I said, okay, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. So he proposed me for membership at that time. And how does that work in the Costa Nostra in America, proposing? Do you have to do an oath? Do you have to do certain things to get into the family? Yeah, well, you can't just go up to somebody and say, hey, I'd like to join. Yeah. You know, yeah, you can't yeah, do yeah. that. Somebody has to propose you, vouch for you, say you have what it takes. In my case, it was my dad. And then um, Joe Colombo, unfortunately, was shot, seriously wounded. Uh, we had a big rally, and he was uh, attempted assassination. He died from the wounds eventually. But a new boss took over. His name was Tom DeBella. So I go sit with Tom. Tom's passed on now. He said, Mike, I have a message from your father. He wants you to become a member of our life. Is that what you want? I said, yes. Here's the deal. From now on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on call to serve this family, the Colombo family. When and if we feel you deserve the privilege, the honor to become a member, we'll let you know. And he said, tell you how serious this is. If your mother is sick and she's dying and you're at her bedside, we call you to service, you leave your mother. You come and serve us. We're number one in your life. So, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people think the mob is a business. It's not a business. Mm. We do business as part of that Mm. life, but it's a whole way of life. Mm. It's a whole subculture from everything else. So that's how it started Mm. for me. And you were, how old were you then when you first started? I was started? 21. 21. And how did you work your way through and up the ranks? Are there, are there certain levels to work up? Well, you have to prove yourself yeah. first to get made. Yeah. And, you know, look, uh, you have to do whatever you're told. You know, it's, um, I'm going to be honest with you. No, my dad said to me the day in the visiting room, he said, listen, I have to ask you one question, son. I said, what's that, dad? He said, if you ever had to kill somebody, could you do it? Just like that. And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, under the right circumstances, yeah, I can do it, Dad. And he said, that's the right answer. So that was kind of the qualification. But then, you know, there's a lot of discipline in that life, a lot of authority, a lot of respect. You had a meeting at 8 o'clock. You, you, were, you didn't, weren't there by 7.30. You were late. You could yeah. never be late in that life. Yeah. You know, drive the boss to a meeting, sit in the car five hours. Yeah. He comes out. You're not there. You're in trouble. Yeah. You know, you go to the restroom, get a newspaper. You, you can't do that. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff like that. And then, listen, if you're given an order, you got to do it. And look, I, I never like to be dishonest. The, obviously, there's only so much I'll say, but the life is very violent at times. And if you're part of the life, you're part of the violence. There's no escape. Mm. And that's, that's the truth. Did you find it easy to be violent at that age? You know, our family, the Columbos, we happen to be one of the warring families. We had three wars in my lifetime. And anytime there's a war, it's over leadership. 
And it's a civil war. Families don't fight. We have five families in New York. They don't fight with one another. That, ha- that stopped in the 40s. There's, when there's disputes, you, sell, you settle it, you know, uh, amicably, I should say. But within the family, you have trouble at times. And so we were one of those families that were always at war. Not always, but quite often. Mm. What sort of numbers are you talking in the families? How many people, say, in the Colombo family at peak? Okay. Um, in all of Cosa Nostra at that time in New York, we had 750 made guys, approximately. Yeah. Our family was one of the smaller ones. We had 115 made guys yeah. during my era yeah. at that time. Uh, Gambino's had 250. Genevieve's had almost 250. Bananos was small, uh, you know. So and the Lucchese's were small. Mm-hmm. But you know, I used to say to my boss, "Why are we? What happened?" He said, "Well, we like quantity over quality." And I'm sorry, quality yeah, over quantity. quantity. Yeah. 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 I said, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but anyway. Was there respect between the families? Oh yeah. You had to respect. Yeah. You know, you, you had to be respectful. A made guy can never disrespect openly another made guy. Mm. Can never raise your hand. You raise your hands to another made guy, you're dead. Mm. That's it. Done. You know, you, you obviously you never violate another made man's wife, daughter, sister, mother. Yeah. Death. Mm-hmm. You can't do any of that. And if you have a sit down, you're sitting down and having a discussion. Here's the thing. Everything was resolved in a sit down, no matter what it was, Right. The boss or whoever was administrating it was there, and then you got to tell you, your story. If you're a made guy in another family and we're discussing something, you're lying through your teeth, yeah. and I know it. Mm. I can't call you a liar. You can't call I it. cannot. If I call you a liar, I lose the argument. You cannot be that So what are you doing then, just keeping it in your mind? No, you have to figure out how to outsmart him. Okay. You know, how to... How to, to catch him out. Yeah, to catch okay. him so that the, whoever's watching can say, oh, this guy's not telling the truth. It's okay. up to him to say that, you know? You can't do that. Now, you know, I came in as a soldier and then I elevated to the position of Kapo Regime, a captain. You have a little more leeway when you're a captain. If one of your soldiers are lying, you could say, hey, cut it out, you know? But uh, you, you still got to be respectful. Was there any resentment to you going into the Colombo family from other people knowing that your dad was who he was? There was resentment for two reasons. Uh, Number one, because when I got made in 1975, they had an expression that the books were closed. They weren't bringing any new guys in from the 50s right to the 70s unless somebody died in the family, they can replace them. But they couldn't bring in new guys. In the mid-70s, they opened the books and they were bringing a lot of guys in. So when I got made, I was actually, you know, a pledge period of recruit for about two and a half years. Guys were waiting 20 years. Yeah. But out of respect for my father, they moved me up front because he said, I need my son. I need help or I'm gonna die in jail. Mm-hmm. So out of respect for him, they moved me up. I mean, I still had to prove myself, yeah. but I jumped ahead. So you get a little resentment there. And then quite honestly, I was a younger guy and, you know, I, I made a lot of money and did well. And you have to deal with the older guys. It's mm. like everyday life, mm. you know, they resent you a bit. Mm. But you got to know how to, you got to know how to navigate that. Mm. And what were you doing to earn a dollar back then? Well, you know, I was very aggressive. Um, I worked seven days a week. I brought some new things into the family. And I was fortunate. Uh, I knew how to use the life to benefit me in business. You know, if you know how to do that, mm. there's benefits to it. Uh, but the biggest scheme that I got involved in uh, was the wholesale gasoline business. And long story short, I devised a scheme with the help of another guy to defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. So defraud the government yeah. on all the petrol in America? Correct. We didn't pay the tax. <laughs> Is that right? We collected the tax. We didn't pay it. How did you do that? How did you collect the tax? <laughs> Very sophisticated scheme. Talk, talk, talk me through it. Different well, companies, close companies I, I'm down. not going to give you all the information because yeah. I don't want anybody to do it in case yeah. they want to go back in it one day. And I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Can't give up my I'll secrets. I'll go partners with you on that one. <laughs> Can't do that, no. My wife would forget about it. I'd be in trouble. But anyway, um, you know, it, it was a very sophisticated scheme. I ran it for about eight years. And I had the Russian how many, mob how many guys. Eight? Almost eight. Okay. Until I went to jail. But... Um, I had 18 companies, they were Panamanian companies at the time, that were licensed to collect tax on on every gallon of gasoline. I had a connection to get the licenses. I had a politician that I was paying, and we were getting the licenses, right? So I had 18 companies, and through a series of accounting maneuvers, I would say, uh, we were able to do, we were able to get 10 months to a year out of a license before the government came down on us. Excuse me, but when they came down, 
we were in an office, we just closed the office, moved to another office and start with another company. So it's kind of a daisy yeah, chain. Yeah. And they could not figure it out. They couldn't, we were always one step ahead of them because, you know, I mean, I had some good people that were pretty smart on mm. board with me. Um, and at the height of our operation, we were doing between eight and $10 million a week. A week? Yeah. We all were selling- All cash? Well, no, not all cash. We had wire transfers yeah, also, okay. but there was a lot of cash. A lot of cash, yeah. But um, yeah, we, we, had, um, we were selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month, taking down American 30, 40 cents a gallon. Because the tax on every gallon that time was nine cents federal mm -hmm. and uh, 20 to 30 cents state and local. So you had, almost, you had 40 cents a gallon yeah. and better. So we were, uh, we were doing pretty well <laughs> back then. Mate, eight to 10 mil a week. Unbelievable. Bring it into the operation. Yeah. Not in my pocket. No, of but, course yeah, not. And then yeah. you've got to shell out all the bits and pieces. Yeah, we've you know, paid up to the family. And, but, you know, I'm not complaining. We, we did okay. How much, we'd, how much of that eight and 10 would you pay up to the family, roughly? When I first sat down with my boss, Carmine Persigal, he, he passed away uh, in 1919, uh, 2019. I went to him and I said, listen, Junior, we called him Junior. I said, I got a deal. I'm going to show you more money than you ever saw in your life. He looked at me immediately and said, we don't do drugs. I said, it's not drugs. You know, I hate anything. I hate anything yeah. to do with drugs. I said, he said, what is it? I said, it's gas. He said, what do you mean? I said, don't worry about it. I said, I got it handled. It's tax money. I got a scheme and I think it's really going to work. So I said, but here's the deal. When I do this, everybody on the street's going to want to be involved. Yeah. And as soon as that happens, we're going to blow it. So here's what you have to do as my boss. He said, what? I said, I have to win every argument. I said, don't play politics. I got to win every argument. If you do that, I said, and I'll be right. I'll be right. If you do that, I'll show you more money than you ever saw before. I'll never forget, you know, he was a tough guy, Junior. Yeah. He looked back, he said, show me. I said, you got it. I started bringing him, at the, at the height of our operation, I was bringing him $2 million a week. <laughs> that buys a lot of loyalty. That <laughs> buys a me. lot of loyalty. I yeah. never lost an argument. Yeah. Never. Yeah. I mean, he, why would he want to cut that off, yeah. you know? And I went up against Gotti, and everybody wanted in. Now, there were some other people doing it, but they couldn't do it like we did. Mm. And eventually, we were, they were buying everything through us anyway. So that's how it was. Was it your brainchild? Was it your uh, idea for this? I wish I could say it was my brainchild, mm. brainchild, but it wasn't. Okay? There was a... <laughs> You know, a lot of people think that we mob guys, we sit in our social clubs and we scheme. What's mm. the next big business mm. that we can, uh, you know, defraud? Mm. It doesn't go like that. Most of the time, some guys from inside their company will come to us. Hey, we have a scheme to defraud the government. You'll protect us. You'll give us money. You're never going to tell on us. Great. And then we analyze it and see if we're going to do it. So in this case, a guy out in Long Island had a small gas operation called Vantage Petroleum. He was a big guy, mm. six foot four, 450 pounds, right? <laughs> So I was the guy on Long Island. He comes to me and he says, listen, there's two guys from another family who are shaking me down. They were extorting him for money. Yeah. He said, can you help me out? He said, if you can, I have a germ of an idea and I think you can help me create this, you know, this massive scheme. And initially I chased him. I didn't like the guy that much, mm -hmm. right? He kept coming back, kept coming back. And he said, come on, Michael, this is the government. I know you hate the government. Mm -hmm. We can do this together. I said, all right. So here's what I do. I said, I'm going to give you a shot. I want you to start a new company. I don't know if you owe taxes or anything. Start a new company. We start a new company. I got a guy around me. His name is Vinny. He was my butcher. Big guy, big scar across the top of his head. And I said, Vinny, I want you to stay with Larry two weeks. Let's see what he's got. You know, watch this guy closely. So one Saturday morning, after about a week and a half, two weeks, Vinny comes to my house, right? Because every Saturday he would bring me meat. You know, he's my mm. butcher. So he comes to the house. He's got a box on his shoulder. And I opened the door and I says, what are we doing with all that meat? We're having a party or something? He says, hey, chief, it ain't meat. Come in the kitchen. I go in the kitchen and he puts the box down, opens it up. And he said, this is the first week and a half in the gas business. $320,000. Smelled like gas. Smelled up the yeah. whole kitchen. I didn't care, right? <laughs> but uh, he got my attention. Mm. We grew that three twenty dollars into $10 million a week mm. over a period of time. Wow. So. It was, it was his idea, no question about it, uh, but I perfected it for mm. him and was able to put, you know, the, the machinery together yeah. to make it work. We had the entrepreneurial spirit mm. to grab it and go, right, how can we expand yeah. this? How many men were in that operation, would you say? 
Well, at one point in time, because I had I had bought a, a big terminal from uh, British Petroleum, and we had some trucks. Uh, I probably had the entire operation with the Russians, probably 300 people working around and under. Not, not, all, not all of them knew me. Yeah. And of course, when you're doing something illegal like that, you don't want people to know you're doing yeah. illegal. So they think it's a, a real operation, mm. you know. But um, it was too many people. Let's put it that way. Mm. It got too big. You know, there was guys that say to me, Michael, you got all this money. Why don't you stop? I said, why? I said, because... You get as much time for a million dollars as you do for a billion. So I may as well carry on. <laughs> yeah, somebody else is going to get it anyway. So that was my thing. <laughs> What's it like dealing with the Russian mafia? Were you introduced by someone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a guy around me that they had this uh, gas stations in Brooklyn called Gas Stop. And believe it or not, somebody was shaking them down for money. These are Russian mob guys, right? So they came to me for help. And when I saw how many gas stations they had, I said, hey, you know, I can put a deal together for you. They said, well, you know, we're trying to sell the tag, take the tax money, but we can't do it. I said, well, I can do it. And so we cut a deal. They had like six or seven. They were very aggressive, right? Towards you or aggressive to get No, involved. they were very aggressive workers. Yeah, okay. I, honestly, we went part, they were best partners I ever yeah, had. Yeah. They worked and they were terrific, right? So we sit down, we cut the deal. I said, listen, here's how it's going to go. 75% um, me, 25% you. I'll never forget. There was three of them, right? <laughs> and uh, one guy looks at me and says, Mr. Michael, we don't think that's fair. I said, no, it's very fair. He said, why? I said, because you're street guys. You're going to steal from me a little bit. I said, so this way I don't get that mad. I said, but don't let me catch you, right? I'll never forget. So the three of them huddle up. For a minute, they come back. They shake my hand. You got a deal. <laughs> Quality. Quality. <laughs> but they were great. Yeah. They, we, we made so much money. They were so aggressive. They brought. They were bringing in... Uh, they were buying most of the product, no, no. really. They were great. How much trust did you have them? Did you ever get any paranoia around dealing with the Russians, or were you okay with it? No, no, no. paranoia at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, did they ever test you, or was it other people? If you're dealing, we've got 300, pe 300 men, you need 300 men to be quiet, or did, you, did they not know the full story? The people below you, you kept them below and let them I, crack I, I on. Tr you try not to, you know, listen, eventually you know you're going to have a problem. You know, there's formats on the street, guys get in trouble. But you try to limit, like I didn't let everybody get close to me. You know, there's only a few people that were close to me. But um, I didn't have paranoia. I was just, you know, my dad taught me very well. You know, there was a couple of things that he taught me that I never forgot. And he said to me, he used to grab a phone. He used to say, Mike, see this phone? It's a cop. Don't talk on the phone, ever. He says, you don't know anybody? Don't talk to them. Don't admit to any. Never admit to anything. He would tell me that all the time. And he said to me another thing. He said, son, if you and I went on the street and we shot somebody, he said, 30 seconds after it happens, if you say to me, hey, dad, that was good, I'm going to say, what are you talking about? Yeah. There's never any reason to repeat mm. anything that you've ever done. Mm. I, I never forgot that. And as a result, I was never, there was no wiretaps that ever got me in trouble, no informants taped up that ever got me in trouble. I was always very careful. I had a lot of undercover investigations on me, a lot of them, but they all, they didn't work. Mm. What's that feeling like knowing you've got undercover old Bill following you, trying to tap you, people trying to get information out? Well, you know, it was a way of life for me because, like I said, I experienced it with my dad. Yeah. They were around me my whole life. So it was just, it was inst instinct. It was way of life. Just be careful who you talk to. Mm. I mean, look, I was arrested 18 times. I was indicted seven times. I had two federal racketeering cases, one state racketeering case. I went to trial five times. So, you know, and then I ended up in prison. So, I mean, it was just a way of life, mm. way of life. What was the racketeering you guys used to get up to? What kind? Well, I mean, I had two RICO cases and, well, three, and two of them involved the gas business. Yeah. And then one of them was a big loan sharking business that allegedly I financed a leasing company that was putting out extortionate loans. Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, me indicted on that. And uh, I was acquitted in that case, too. Mm. They could never, they never got me on trial. I was, I was, I had three hung juries, one case dismissed, and one I beat in acquittal. On the case dismissed, what happened there? At the end of the uh, government's case, the judge said there's no evidence here. And he threw it out. They, you know, there's, it, it's different with organized crime. Mm. You know, normally a crime takes place, right? And you investigate yeah. the crime and you find out who did it. In our case, 
they're investigating us trying to find out what crime we're committing. Mm. So it's it's back it's different, mm. you know? So they never have anything so solid mm. until the mid eighties when the racketeering case started to come uh, the racketeering statute started to come in and it was devastating for my life, my former life. Devastating because so many guys were becoming informants. Were they? Oh yeah. Well out of the hundred and thirty or guys working underneath you, there was informants in there. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. When I, I beat the Giuliani case, they indict me on this whole gasoline case, my partner became an informant. The guy, the big guy that yeah. started here, yeah, he yeah, became yeah. an informant. He got himself in trouble on an unrelated case, unrelated, and they locked him up. He fled the country, went to Panama, because we, we had a big compound in Panama. No extradition from Panama to the United States. So we had a big compound there, right? Compound is a house to live, place to live. Yeah, we had okay. a big, beautiful yeah, spot yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And I had my own jet plane at the time, so we <laughs> flew back and forth. Quality. So he, go, he gets himself in trouble. He goes on trial, right, yeah. for some tax stupid thing. And he comes to me and says, Chief, I'm not going to jail. He said, I'm leaving. I'm going to go to, to, to Panama and stay there. There's no extradition. I said, you're crazy. If they catch you, they're going to add on another five years. Now I'm going. So he goes. And long story short, he, uh, being that there's no extradition, listen to the United States. Mm. They went in there in the middle of the night, middle of the night, and they kidnapped him out of his house and brought him to Florida. They kidnapped wow. him, right? Mm. As soon one of the FBI agents told me, you know, he's six foot four or five, mm. 450 pounds. They open the door to the cell. He sees that cot about this big. He says, I'll tell you whatever you want to know about Michael. Is that right? <laughs> Just like that. Yeah, he couldn't do time, right? So he became the informant against me. So um, I pled guilty in that case. And I mean, we could be here for seven yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I pled guilty in that case. Why, why, why did he grass on you? If couldn't he knew do. the backlash, what was going to happen to him? Because well, he couldn't handle going being in, in prison. Couldn't go to jail. Okay. And you know, listen, put you in a witness protection program. We'll change your identity. We'll give you money. You know, don't worry about the guy. He's going to jail forever because under the RICO statute, you can get two hundred years. Yeah. Crazy statute. Yeah. So you know, he bought into that, and um, so rather than go to trial, I took a plea on that case. I had a ten-year prison sentence. I had a fifteen million dollar restitution. Five million in forfeitures. I gave them the plane. I had a helicopter the whole bit. And I had a couple of houses that I gave them. And uh, I went off to do my time. So they gave you 10 years because he grasped you up? Yeah. But they were, on a, out of those eight years, how many of those years were they on your case, do you reckon? The police were on your case. Out of the eight years, you're doing the whole petrol scam. How many years do you think, you know what, we're getting away with this, getting away with it, oh, things are coming on top now. And you're looking around going, things are definitely coming on top. Was it after four years, after five years, after six years? Well, I kept beating all these cases, yeah. you know. So I knew the only way I was going to get in trouble was by an informant. But I'll tell you what happened. Well, I was in custody, right, because they gave me no bail. Yeah. Because they, they had to do something because every time I was out on the street, my lawyers and everything, we were beating all these cases. Yeah. So they hold me with no bail. And the re they hold me no bail. Now, listen, there's only two ways you can hold somebody with no bail. One, he's a threat. This, so there's a, yeah. oh, he's going to kill people. Yeah. Or number two, he's a flight risk. They couldn't say I was a flight risk. I never missed one minute. I was always in every trial, everything. Yeah. I always showed up. And there was no violence in my case. So they couldn't say I was a danger to the community. Mm -hmm. They created something new. They said he's an economic danger to the community because he's robbed millions and billions of dollars, right? So they held me with no bail. So... When I decided to take the plea, I had to go to Florida to take a plea because they indicted me there. Mm. And then, so I was in custody. They were flying me down to Florida. I got 15 agents with me, right? So they're flying me back after I took the plea and they're all sitting around. They said, Michael, we've been investigating you for so many years. Tell us, when we were over here, were we right about this thing? Because, you know, now it was over. Mm. I said, nah, you, you, you guys weren't right about that. I said. They said, why did you take the plea? I said, I got tired of beating you guys. I said, you know, I figured, let me give you one win, right? I said, I, I got tired of beating you. And I'll never forget, one agent looked at me and he said, Michael, not this time. He said, well, I said, what do you mean? He said, you became a superstar. They were lining up to testify against you because right. you were their ticket out. Yeah. And you know what? He was right. Mm. He was right. That's how bad it got mm. in the mid-80s. So by taking the plea, I eliminated all of that. Mm. 
And I got a, I got a good deal because believe it or not, 10 years was a good deal. Guys yeah. were going away for 50 years, yeah. 100 years. Yeah. So 10 years was a good deal. What, for you to say, hands up, they have the money, have the houses. Yes, this has been I'm going done. on. I'm done. Okay. But, but what I had to do, any, any prior investigation that they had, once I took the plea, it was it. All gone. They, gave, I, they couldn't investigate me against anything except for murder. They wouldn't give me immunity for murder, but I wasn't worried about that, right? So hold I on, said, hold on. Did you get nicked for murder? Did I? Did you? No. No, okay. They tried, but they tried. no, they fortunately they were unsuccessful. But um, so for me, I said it was a good deal because I had a plan at that point. I had met this young girl, it's now my wife, and I was going to try to get away from the life because I. Dutch, I'm I'm watching guys. I'm in jail. Guys are going to jail. I mean, going to trial, getting convicted, a hundred years, yeah, yeah. 150 yeah. years. I said, I'm the youngest out of all of these guys. They're going to give me 500 years. Yeah. I said, I got to get out of here. And then I'm seeing guys become informants that I knew that were stand up guys on the street. I said, we're in a lot of trouble. This life is in trouble. Yeah. yeah. So that's when I planned my exit strategy. How old were you when you got put away? I was uh, I was thirty four when I went 34. in. Thirty four. Yeah. And how many years was this running for? When you're knowing that your mates, your tight men, you can look in the eye and go, right, they're going to back me at every moment. Are actually starting to grasp and inform. Well, I didn't see it until the Rico lost. Until I was in, and I start seeing guys folding. Yeah. You know, one of the guys. I don't know if you ever heard the name Greg Scarpa. Mm. Grim Reaper, mm. Greg. Yeah. He was a captain along with me, right? We found out he was an informant for 20 years. Now, I sat with this guy two, three times a week. So I said, oh, my gosh, this is going to be a headache for me. He never said anything about me. This other guy, Willie Boy Johnson, who was with Gotti, yeah. I was Shylock and money with him. And I said, my gosh, I got another guy. He's going to put me in trouble. He never said anything about me. So I got fortunate with these two guys, and then they both ended up getting killed afterwards. But... Um, but I'm saying, you know, now I can't trust anybody. Yeah. I had my main partner. I can't trust anybody. So this is time to get out. If your main partner's grassing you up, you definitely won't be able to trust anyone around you. Yeah. Wow. No. And so many guys went down with informants. It's, it was terrible. Terrible. Did any of them get the fear knowing you were one of the top dogs, top men there? Going, hold on a minute. I know you're a former. I clocked you. I clocked you. I clocked you. If I'm getting a 10, you lot aren't getting out alive. Well, my guy, I Rizzo, um, when he testified against me, I had one of my guys in the courtroom, he, and he only testified at a bail hearing, but I had one of my guys in the courtroom, and when he seen the guy, he stopped the proceeding, and he was visibly shaking. Yeah. And he, the, the uh, marshals came up to me and him and said, that guy's got to leave the courtroom. I said, why? He said, because your witness is afraid of him. I said, he's not my witness, he's your witness. Mm -hmm. I remember. I said, what is he afraid of? We're in a courtroom. Yeah. I said, he's afraid because he's lying up there. That's what mm -hmm. I said. But anyway, uh, so yeah, I mean, look, guys are scared. There's no question. But listen, let me tell you what destroyed our life. Mm -hmm. You know, our life is, do you ever see the Bronx Tale? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Chaz Palminteri yeah. is a very good friend of mine. Yeah. You remember when uh, Colosio says to him, would you rather be loved or feared? Yeah. And he said, I'd rather be feared yeah. because I need people to fear me in this life. Well, what happened, for a time that was true because fear kept a lot of guys in line. Mm. But when the RICO Act came out, the fear of the life was transferred to the government. Right. Because now they're saying, hey, you either cooperate or you're spending the rest of your life in prison and we're going to put you in solitary. Yeah. And you destroyed your family and everything else. You cooperate with us, don't worry about it. You'll be out. That guy's going to jail forever. We'll give you a new identity. We'll give you some money. Boom. What deal are you going to yeah, take? Yeah. That's what destroyed our life because mm. so many guys became informants. Would you understand why some are become an informant? I think there are certain circumstances where, yes, I can understand that. But look, in my personal experience, my personal experience, I've never seen an informant get up on the stand, left hand Bible, right hand swear to tell the truth, and lie through their teeth. Seen it against my father a couple of times, mm. you know, and in my case too. I've seen people, I can't believe this guy is saying this, yeah. but you know, it, it happens. But in every case, no. I, I have seen some cases where guys, you know, 
they put a lot of time and effort into that life, and then they were screwed in the end. So they say, hey, what do I, what do I got to keep this oath yeah. for, you know? So, you know, it, it's a hard call. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't like to judge anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am I have relationships, guy. You know, Sammy Gravano, Sammy mm -hmm. the Bull. Yeah. He and I are friends. Why, where was the fallout between you and Sammy the Bull? Oh, originally, you know, he was one of those guys, you know, hey, you know, guys resented you because you became a made guy before. I said, what do you want from me, Sammy? Yeah. I didn't make that decision. They made that decision. We, we went at it a little bit. Mm. But, you know, we patched it up afterwards because we got together and said, Sammy, it's it's no good for everybody to see us arguing. Yeah. And, you know, I love his family. Yeah. His son his son calls me up. Hey, Mike, how do I deal with my father? <laughs> <laughs> Getting good advice kid. from you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And his yeah. daughter, uh, Karen, I interviewed her on my YouTube channel. One of the best interviews. I was so honest. Just she was terrific. Lovely. So, I mean, I really, I really liked the family. And mm. I got to like Sammy. Mm. People knocked me for, how could you say with Sammy? He hey, don't worry about mm. it. Don't tell me who to be friends mm. with, you know? So, and there's some others too. But, uh, you know, the other guys that were, they were after my time, mm. you know? So from a roughly about 28 to 35, those sort of years, you were doing the petrol scam. Before those years, how were you earning a pound note? Sorry, how were you earning a dollar before those years? The nightclub world? sporting world music film i was uh i was very innovative mm. i mean i i just like i said i knew how to use the life and uh yeah i had i had uh, a film production company i had a lot of clubs that you know i had little interests in i had two automobile dealerships that i owned outright a chevrolet and a mazda dealership i had a leasing company out of auto body shops so i mean i i got involved in a lot of different things and, uh, and then obviously a gas business. Mm. But, you know, I was entrepreneurial in that yeah. regard. Do you not think there's a fine line as an entrepreneur like ourselves? There's a fine line for entrepreneurs where you can either go that way and stick to the normal, clever, legitimate route, and it's quite easy to flip that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you ever have any regrets flipping that way where you could have earned a lot of money going straight? No. no. <laughs> let, let me tell you, I, I get... My wife would kill me. I say this in church and she gets upset at me. I said, listen, I'm going to be honest with you, everybody. Right now, today, I have no moral issue with stealing money from the government. Mm. Yeah. No moral issue. I'm they're still, corrupt. They're all I'm corrupt. still going ahead. Yeah. I could do better with the money than they yeah. can. Yeah. Okay. But I won't do it because I'm not going to break the law and you know jeopardize mm. my freedom and my family again. But... You know, listen, the things that I did, I had two legitimate uh, uh, auto agencies. Mm. I had a very legitimate um, production company, except for the fact that I financed a couple of movies with stolen tax money. But so what, right? <laughs> <laughs> paid everybody. Yeah, you know, yeah, everybody yeah. got paid. It was, le it was legitimate production. Yeah. Just we, we had crazy money. But, yeah. you know, so, I mean, I kept things straight and I ran my businesses straight, mm. you know, other than the gas business, mm. because that's what it was. So I don't, I don't have any regrets. I put money out on the street. I always had a lot of money on the street. But people come to me, they can't go to a bank, they come to me, boom, I gave them money, yeah. you know, if I thought it was a good deal. That's mm. how I got the Chevrolet agency. Mm. And then I had a lot of, uh, I was in the gambling business, but not myself personally, I had bookmakers that worked for me. And so we were, you know, we were in the gambling business and a lot of athletes were gambling with us, mm. but that's part of the street. Mm. Did you get involved in sport at all? As far as did you get into like involved in a sports agency or did you get anything? I did. Yeah, I had a uh, there was a fellow by the the name of Norby Walters who had he was a an agent for all the black acts, big ones, Dionne Warwick, Michael Jackson. You know, he yeah. represented them on their tours, and he decided to go into the sports representation business, mm -hmm. and I went partners with him. What sort of percentage did you take? Uh, well, I gave him, uh, I think I gave him 250 grand at the time and, you know, 20%, whatever. Yeah. I don't remember what the percentage mm. was, but it, it, it didn't turn out good mm. after, uh, because I went to jail. He got himself in trouble. He started threatening the athletes. It was all a mess. But um, what was the business model? Was it university athletes who are then going to be on your book to then be bought by yes. the big clubs? No, he would represent them for their pro career, yeah. except what he did, okay, which I okayed at the time, he was signing the athletes prior to their eligibility, which you weren't allowed yeah, to do. Okay. But he would sign it, put the, the, the uh, agreement in the draw, mm -hmm. and give them money mm -hmm. on top of that, 20000 25000 What, to lock them in? So there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. But what happened later on, 
the athletes say, I don't want to be with you, and I'm leaving. And I'm in jail at that time, mm. and he starts threatening the athletes with my name. Oh, no. So I'm in okay. jail. In the middle of the night, 3 o'clock, they pick me up, take me to Chicago. I said, what, what are we doing? You know? And they told me, I said, well, I don't know anything about this. I'm in prison. Mm. I don't know what he's doing. You know, it was a whole mess. Mm. How many nights a week do you reckon you were spending in nightclubs in your 20s, early 30s? Six. Same. <laughs> you too? Yeah. Yeah, well, that was the <laughs> That's life That's the way it was, then. yeah. Sunday we stay home. Yeah, Sunday, absolutely. What was the, what was the, you going in there for meat clubs, going in there partying, what was the yeah. lifestyle like? It was great, quite honestly. Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, we met in clubs, but, uh, you know, and I had an interest in some of them, but we just partied, mm. you know, just out uh, and with the guys a lot. Now, mm. of course, there was women around, but, you know, when I got into the life, what was really attractive to me was the brotherhood, this camaraderie yeah. among men, you know, I got your back, you got mine. Mm. I don't think there's anything more powerful yeah. other, other than a marriage obviously there's nothing more powerful than that you know this brotherhood and this bond between men so i found that very attractive mm -hmm. and we were together all the time mm -hmm. you know and we'd be out six nights a week i mean at home you know in new york mm -hmm. you can stay out all night mm -hmm. so i mean my routine was and i was married before mm -hmm. once before um, I come home for dinner most of the time, and then 10 o'clock, I'm out. Mm. You know, guys pick me up, we go, and mm. stay out for three, four hours. I never required a lot of sleep. So even if I got home at three or four in the morning, I was up at seven mm. and gone, you know. So when you were doing your legitimate businesses, were you still in the Colombo, you were in the Colombo family yeah. still while you're doing legit businesses? Yeah. What's the sort of the day in the life of Michael on something along that when you're trying to juggle legit with Dorty? Well, you know, when I was a soldier, because um, after I got made in 75, you're a soldier, you're a little bit more, you have to report more. I had to report to my captain, my cop regime. Mm. I had to go to Brooklyn, because that's where he would hang out. So that was probably three, four, five times a week. It was a grind. I hated going, but I had to. Um, when I became a captain in 1980, they elevated me to that position. Then I had more of my own time to do. And then the guys, my soldiers would come to me mm. wherever I told them to meet me. So, you know, my daily routine was I'd get up, I'd go to my office in the morning. If I don't have, if I didn't have to go into Brooklyn for whatever mm. reason, do my day. And, you know, I, I you know, the, the other thing is when you're in that position, people are uh, approaching you all yeah. the time. They got a deal. Yeah business, this and that and that. So I made a rule. I had a club called um, uh, Michael's, mm. okay? I, I didn't name it after me. It was called Michael's already. But I said, if you wanted to see me and propose any, you had to come there on a Monday night. And that was it. And then don't bother me during the week. And um, so that was, you know, I'd, I'd work during the day, take care of my guys. You know, the other thing too, when you're a, a captain in that life and you're as active as I was, you're always sitting down to resolve an issue. Your guys are getting in trouble. The guys got this. So it was a lot of work, mm. you know? To, and when you have a crew of men mm. that are always doing something crazy yeah. and you're sitting down and resolving it all the time, mm. it's, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm in my auto dealership one day <clears throat> and this big Jewish guy, Jerry used to work for me, right? Big guy, very animated. I see him in the lot and he's having an argument with somebody, right? So he comes up and he's cursing it back and forth. He comes up and I said, what was that all about? He said, oh, this guy says we sold him a lemon for a car. I said, well, what'd you do? He said, well, he starts bringing up, you know, made guys mentioning his uh, brother-in-law, Mario. And I said, well, what did you tell him? He said, I said, well, F Mario and F you. I said, Jerry, I told you don't do that. You know, people know people around here. You don't talk like that. He says, well, he don't know anybody. He's, he's a Jew like me. Mm -hmm. I said, well, who do you know, mm -hmm. right? You know? Anyway, we let it go. Next day, uh, two days later, another made guy calls me up. He says, Mike, something important, you gotta come into Brooklyn. So I said, okay. So I said, Jerry, drive me. And Vinny, remember the butcher? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. drive me. So we go to this, uh, I had to meet him at a Chinese restaurant. And we go in the back of the restaurant. I said, Jerry, Vinny, you guys wait here at the bar. We go in the back and there's a guy there. He's sitting down, older guy. He's got two guys to his left and right. My guy how to introduce us as made guys. Cause you can't just go up to another made mm -hmm. guy and say, I'm made with the Columbus, mm -hmm. you know. He had to introduce us mm -hmm. as, as made guys. So we sit down and I said, what can I do for you? So he looks at me, he said, my name is Mario. I said, okay, didn't ring a bell. He says, you got some Jew around you named Jerry Zimmerman? I said, yeah, he says, 
I want him dead. And he pounds the table like that. I say, oh my God, Mario, ding, that, and now. Here's the problem. Jerry's out in the bar. If they call Jerry in and he sits down and he says something wrong mm. before I could school him, mm. I can't, I may not be able to save mm. him, right? I said, hey, hey, Mario, I said, I had a long trip from Long Island. I got to go to a restaurant. I'll be right back. So I go out in the bar. I said, Jerry, Mario's in there. Get out of here, yeah. right? Go down to the diner, wait for me. So I chase him out. And we go back and he's, uh, this guy, you know, blah, blah, blah. He sold my uh, brother-in-law a lemon and he said, F me and this and that and that. He don't talk like that. I want him dead and blah, 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 blah. So I had a lie. I said, Mario, hold on a minute. I said, your brother-in-law is not telling you the truth. He said, what do you mean? I said, I was in the upstairs. The window was open. I heard the whole argument. Mm. I had a lie, right? Mm. I said, your brother-in-law was disrespectful. I should be here wanting his head. Okay, you got it all wrong. I said, but I'm not going to do that out of respect for you. Back and forth. My brother never lied to me. I said, well, Jerry never lied to me either, you know? So he says, Bob, 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 I want him dead. I said, well, then I got to kill your brother-in-law. I said, we're going to go back and forth. This is how it's going. <laughs> I'm not kidding yeah, you. Yeah. Three hours, this guy would not give in. He said, okay, let me put him in a hospital. I said, well, then I got to put your brother-in-law in a hospital. I said, we're going to go back and forth. I can't do it. So finally, I'm saying, I'm never going to win with this guy. He's going to go upstairs. We're going to go to the front of the board. I says, here's Mario. Here's what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to give your brother-in-law a new car. Tell him you won the argument, whatever. New car on me, no problem, right? He says, but I said, that's my best offer. If not, we got to go upstairs. We got to take it to the boss. So he finally agrees, right? But he was, he was resentful mm -hmm. of me and he was angry. So here's what happens. I bawled Jerry out. I said, I told you this and that now, right? I said, Jerry, I don't trust this guy. He was so angry with you, whatever reason. I said, you have a brother in California. Go out to California. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure this is really resolved. I said, stay out there until I call you back. He goes. Maybe a month later, he calls me up. He says, uh, hey, hey, Chief, we're going to be in the movie business. I said, what do you know about movies, right? He said, oh, it's easy. Don't worry. I got a director. I got a script. It's a horror movie. They're big right now. He says, send me 83000 you and my partner. I said, okay. So I sent him the money, right? P.S., okay, a million dollars later, he produces most of my money. He produces this movie called Mausoleum mm. that didn't scare anybody but me <laughs> because of the amount of money we put in. But that's how I got in the movie business. Wow. And what roughly year was then, that? that was Early in, 80s? No, that was in, uh, that was like, yeah, 80, 81. Was it? Yeah. Are you, are you, how much do you reckon you've earned at your peak in total? Like the whole okay. petrol scam. Are we talking hundreds of millions? Are we talking yeah. billion dollar here? We're talking hundreds of millions. Hundreds of yeah. millions coming into your bank. How what percentage would it be cash versus in straight in the bank, would you say? Initially, it was a lot of cash. Yeah. But then when the, the government changed the law mm. where you had to be a wholesaler, then a lot of it was through wires. Yeah. So I had bank accounts set up in various places, and uh, it, it was work just to take care of the money. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. How, how, how many like petrol stations were they? Petrol stations plotted around America in different states in the 51 no, states. How it wasn't it different states. I had I had over 300 and, uh, about 325 stations. I either owned or operated, mm -hmm. leased, whatever. Um, and then we had wholesale. We were selling to everybody. Branded stations, unbranded stations, because I'd send my guys into a station and say, listen, how many loads are you buying from BP? Yeah. Oh, we buy six a week. Okay, buy four from them, buy two from us, mm. right? We'll send it to you in the middle of the night. Before you know it, we'll save you 10 cents a gallon. That's mm. a lot of money yeah, for yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. Before you know it, they want to buy it all from us. And yeah. I said, no, you can't do that. You're going to lose your branding, you know? And then you're going to, so we had to stop them from buying. Yeah from us because we gave them a bill of sale all taxes mm. included that was it they didn't care so you knew not to be too greedy at that we had time to be, yeah you had to be clever yeah we yeah. wouldn't we wouldn't sell them as much as they wanted yeah. even though we could have yeah so the idea is get as many stations as many accounts as you can mm. so we were selling and we were up and down the east coast right through florida i had a big operation florida indicted me i think it was i don't know 393 million something like that <laughs> Yeah, I don't even remember. That was insane, <laughs> insane numbers. That's insane amount of cash, money yeah. flying around. What were you doing with the cash? Did you ever give cash away? Did you ever like throw it out of planes and helicopters and f give money away? You, on must, the have heard, you must have heard that story. Go right? on. Did you hear that Go story? On. Okay. 
So we have a helicopter, and me and my partner, before we became informant, we used to go uh, to some of the stations to collect the money, right? So we were in Jersey, and we're coming back. It was a beautiful day in New York, and every time we would get to the Statue of Liberty, he would tell the pilot, circle the lady, right? <laughs> so we're circling the Statue of Liberty, and the exhibit was open that day. There's a lot of people waiting to get in. So he looks down, he says, hey, hey, Chief, what do you think those people would think if they knew we had all this? We had about 300, 400,000 in the, in the uh, helicopter. He says, what do you think they would do if they knew that? I says, well, why don't we find out? I says, let's share the wealth. Open the window, throw some money out, right? <laughs> so we open the window and we start throwing 20s and it was all small bills, yeah, 20s yeah. and 10s and everything out there. Before long, they didn't care about the exhibit. They were falling <laughs> over themselves to get the money, <laughs> right? Me. It was a sight like you would not. But if I had a cell phone back yeah. then, forget it. And so we're doing that. And then I said, hey, we better get out of here because if they've seen it, they're going to find us or whatever. But it was in a newspaper like the next Brilliant. day or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What was your lifestyle like, Michael, back then at peak? What sort of houses, boats, cars, people, restaurants, clubs? What was, what was the whole, if you could explain it in a... Well, we had the, uh, you know, I had the uh, Bell helicopter. We had uh, a Learjet, a Lear 25A. How much would a roughly Learjet cost? Lear was, then? I think, two and a half million at that point. Yeah. Back then? Back then, yeah. It was brand new. And the helicopter was, it was only about three or four hundred thousand. It wasn't that expensive. Yeah. But, um, and then we had a, a motor home that we paid 350 grand that I never used. We just had it. And uh, I had a house in Florida on the water. I had two boats in the backyard. I had a house in Marina del Rey, California. And I had a house in, uh, in New York, in Long Island. It was, uh, it was on two acres of land I built. It was an 8,000 square foot house with a racquetball court and uh, two acres of land and the whole bit. So, you know, we lived, we lived good. And uh, I mean, it was, you know, what could I tell you? It was a lot of fun. Did you ever think, like buying all these houses, buying everything, you're bringing a lot of attention to yourself? You're thinking, I don't care. You get to a point where I say, I don't care. I didn't We're care. Having fun. Yeah, I had legitimate business. Yeah. I was paying taxes back then, but yeah. stealing them, paying them, you know. So, <laughs> um, I didn't care. I mm. mean, I had I had a tremendous resentment for the government yeah. back then. It really tremendous. I mean, mm. I didn't like them. I didn't care. I just made sure I covered myself as mm. best I could. What's the one most expensive thing you've ever bought in your life? You know, it wasn't, it, let me tell you, I wasn't like a flashy dresser. No, no. I didn't like, a, I, even now, yeah. I didn't like uh, diamonds yeah. and all, I, I, none of that stuff, mm. even till today. I don't mm. care about any of that. Um, I mean, personally, I didn't spend a lot of money on myself. Mm. You know, I mean, the plane and all that stuff, it was a good convenience. The helicopter was great because mm. the feds could not follow me mm. anywhere. You know, we'd drive them crazy. So it was a great convenience in mm. New York. I mean, I guess the houses, mm. you know, that we bought, I bought, but I bought it mostly for my family, you yeah. know, for me. I didn't, honestly, I'm, I'm a pretty modest living mm. guy, mm. you know, even now. I, I need very little. Mm. And I was the same way back then. Mm. But, you know, I had a lot of guys around me. Listen, you know, when I had all my guys, I, I never forget, I sat down the 15 closest guys to me. I sat them down. And I said, listen, if any of you guys want to get made, mm. you want to be part of this life, not going to happen with me. Mm. I'm not going to propose you, not going to happen. You want your stripes, this is not the place mm. for you. If you want to go, it's okay, no resentment, fine. And they said, well, why? I said, very simple, I'm going to put a lot of effort into you, and if you become a made guy, I lose you. Yeah. You're your own man at that point. You don't owe me anything, I'm done. You know, Maybe morally you owe me something, mm. but what good is that? Mm. You know." I said, so you're free to go. I said, however, if you want to make money, this is the place to be because I'm going to make you all mm. very wealthy. No, nobody left. Yeah, you know, money is important. Yeah, I mean, what they did afterwards, but um, and, and that was my feeling. And you know, I, I treated everybody well. Mm. Everybody made a lot of money around me, and you know, and a, a lot of the crews resented us for it. Quite honestly, who are the crews? I mean, other the other guys that seen it, okay. you know. Yeah, you you have to navigate that in that life. Mm. It's people are always looking at you, mm. you know. Were you on your way up to the underboss or the next level of the family before you got nicked? My my father's strong desire was to make me be the boss. Yeah. He said, and he used to tell me, "Bide your time," you know. 
because my father still was very well respected, even though he kept going back to jail. And I said to him, Dad, if you keep going back to jail, nothing's going to happen here. But I honestly didn't want it yeah. because it's so much work. Yeah. You know, you, you got these guys around you all the time. And I hated going to Brooklyn. I wanted to be in Florida. I wanted to be in California. I was mm -hmm. more the younger breed. You know, mm -hmm. I was having a good time uh, aside from everything else. But they were planning to make me either the boss or the underboss because my boss had a son, Alley Boy, who's doing life in prison now. For, he, what is, was he doing life for? A Rico murder, a Rico murder, okay. like everybody, yeah. Rico murder case. Uh, and he baptized my son. We were very close. So they were grooming us to take over the family mm -hmm. at some point. And when I walked away, he actually did become acting boss because his father went to jail. Mm -hmm. And I would have been acting underboss until we became official when mm -hmm. our father said, okay, this is it. But, um, you know, when I decided to leave, that was the end of that. But, yeah, they, they were grooming me and, and probably would have happened. Mm. Did you want it? No. I honestly did not. I had enough eyes on me, you know, and when I'm, especially when I'm watching what's happening to everybody else, you know, look at my father, you know, I, and I want to, I want to be clear because I know we've been talking a lot about mm -hmm. the life. I call that life an evil lifestyle. Yeah. I'm not calling the guys evil. Yeah. I was one of them. I happen to be very fortunate, but I don't know any family of any member of that life that hasn't been destroyed, yeah. including my own, yeah. not my wife and kids. Yeah. My mother spent 33 years without her husband. When she died in 2012, I can only describe her relationship with my dad as being ugly because yeah. she blamed him for everything that went wrong. What went wrong? Sister, 27 years old, died as an overdose of drugs. I can't even be, I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to make an admission. More people got hurt from me because of my sister than because of that life. I go into a club in Queens. I'm looking for her at night. I see her in Queens with some derelict drug addicts hanging around her, and I, I would lose my mind. Yeah. You know, I had to pull her out of there. Finally, she overdosed, 27 years old. My brother, 25 years a drug addict. What I had to do to keep him alive on the street because he was robbed this guy, robbed that guy. If he wasn't my father's son yeah. and my brother, he'd have been dead a long time ago, yeah. right? He's, he's alive now, but his life... He's off the drugs and everything, but he works in a rehab. Mm. He's got to go to AA meetings all the time. You know, it's terrible, lonely guy. My younger sister, 41 years old, never mentally strong. She dies at 41. Oh, yeah. The whole family's yeah. destroyed. Yeah. And every family of every member is same thing, similar. John Gotti's family, they're, they're all the same. Mm. So any lifestyle that does that to a family is no good. Mm. And that's why, you know, for the past 25 years, I've been speaking to juveniles and, yeah. and these gangbangers and going into prisons and juvenile mm -hmm. halls. Get away from that mm -hmm. life. You're going to, it's a dead end street. Have you ever seen family members turn on each other? Have you ever turned on each other in a family? Oh, absolutely. It's, it happens. I mean, look, my brother testified against my father and put my father back in jail. What? He testified against your Yes. My, my, my brother got my father violated in his parole. We didn't know it. He was talking to the cops. And then he became an informant, went in a witness protection program, and testified against my dad when my dad was 93 years old and put my father back in jail for eight years. My father was released at the age of 100, thanks to my brother. Oh, my God. So any, why, any, why, what, how did you react when you knew your brother did that to your old man? <clears throat> well, listen, I knew my brother. I, I had told my father, I said, Dad, you cannot trust him. He's a drug addict. You know, they do crazy yeah. things. But I love my brother, mm. so it's hard. I still love my brother, you know. But my dad had a soft spot and was hanging around. My brother was wired, you know. My dad said some bad things to him. I mean, he's talking to his son. And ended up uh, going to jail for eight years based upon my brother's testimony. From the age of 93 when he was out, he got put back in. Yeah, he was, out, he, he was out on parole. He had, his parole was violated, right? Yeah. He gets out on that. Didn't realize my brother violated him because they didn't tell him who the witness was. He gets out, still hanging with my brother. My brother's wired along with another guy. And he gets indicted on another case. My brother testifies in court. I was stunned. I was there during a the trial. And my father gets convicted and gets eight years. Jeez. Yeah. So what's going through your head then when you found out your brother oh, had done man. that? I, and I, 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 you know, I said, "Is he going to? What is he going to say about me?" You yeah. know, that's the first thing you also you think. But he didn't. 
my brother loved me because he, he, you know, look, I raised the kid. Mm. I really did and kept him alive. Mm. And I didn't see my brother for 10 years, right? And after he testified, and then I had a 70th birthday, and my wife, who loved my brother, invited him to the birthday party. I was stunned. And, and you didn't know? No, I didn't know he oh, was coming. Man. And when I saw him, it was like, whoa. And that was two years ago. So we've been close ever since, you know. And, and uh, But it's, uh, I mean, any life can turn a son against his no. father. And, Why? And, and that's, Why? I don't why? Know. There's a reason why your brother turned against your old man. Oh. You know, you know what it is. If you, if you listen to my brother, he looks. He'll say, "How did we survive this crazy, turbulent?" My house was n yeah. crazy, yeah. right? How did we survive it? And I said, "Well, you guys didn't. I just happened to be blessed. I did, but you guys really didn't." And it, it, when you listen to him, you kind of understand. He had resentment towards my dad, you know, for a lot of things. And I was always anti my brother about what he did until I really had a heart to heart with him. And he made me understand some things that I didn't know he was going through. And my sister, the same thing, mm. you know, and I 100% I attribute, <clears throat> excuse me, their challenges to my dad being away. My mother was a very difficult woman. Very, very difficult. Very strong, very independent. She was a match for my father. Yeah. But she wasn't all there either. I mean, my mother, you'd love her one minute, the next minute, watch your back. Yeah. You know, it was tough stuff with her. So, and these kids were in the middle of all of that. Mm. And I don't know how, you know, I don't know how I, I just come out of that. Mm. I really don't. But I did. Did you, did you do a deal with the police to get only 10 years? Or was that laid on the table for you if you admitted to everything? No, I didn't. I had no deal, no okay. cooperation deal, nothing. What happened was, here's what happened. In the Giuliani case, mm. when my partner became an informant, the yeah. IRISO, yeah. Giuliani, who had a lot of pull, he was like the second most powerful U.S. attorney in the country, New York. Yeah. He got that witness. His district was the Southern District. The gas business was coming out of Brooklyn, which was the Eastern District. I Rizzo, my partner, was the Eastern District's witness. Yeah. But uh, Giuliani was able to get him to testify against me in the case, right? We destroyed him on the witness stand, and I get acquitted. So now the government's main witness against me in the yeah. gas case yeah. is destroyed. Uh, yeah. So they got scared. <clears throat> they said, he's going to beat us again. I had already beat him five times. That's when they were willing to make a deal. I had leverage. Okay. Otherwise, I would have never made a deal with yeah, me. Yeah. And so when it was 10 years, they said, okay. They didn't know that my strategy was to get away from the life. Mm. So they figured, all right, at least now we got a conviction on him. Mm. We got a big restitution, big this, we won. Mm. He'll come out, he'll get in trouble again. Mm. They didn't realize I was leaving. Yeah. So, um, no, they didn't. There was no cooperation whatsoever. Mm. What was that feeling like for you knowing the surname you've got going into prison, was it instant respect? Did you run wings around there? How was it? <laughs> I'll tell you what happens. If you, if you got room for mate, another story, I got a million stories. Mate, you, I guess, I'm loving this. Okay, but wait a second now. Yeah. A lot of these stories I got to tell, I'm not telling all because I got a lot more for my tours tour, coming up. Tour coming out okay? in March, in around March, the UK. We're doing at least to nine, 10, 12 dates, something like yeah. that. Great promoters doing a tremendous job. You're this in really is, good hands with Ella. Ella's terrific. She's and Sean. And Sean Sean, Alwood, Sean great. and Ella are brilliant. Yes, and I want everybody to know this is only the tip of the iceberg. I have a lot more. There's things that I want to talk about that I've never talked about before. Mm. I'm going to be honest with mm. you because you know what? You don't have mafia here in, in uh, yeah. the United Kingdom. Mm. You don't. And I want to thank all the people. I'm not kidding you. I walked out of here today just mm. to go across. I forgot the the electric plug, right? Mm. So I go to across the street to Boots to buy one. Hey, Michael, how are you? And I can I take your picture? It's unbelievable. Yeah. I love the people here mm. in the UK. They I love, love you. The British yeah. love you, yeah. Uh, great. So mm. I'm looking forward to this tour. Mm. So please, if you're listening in now, you know, we're going to post the schedule. We're jump gonna, on We're going to put all the links below. Everything's going to be plugged. We're going to plug it hard. We're doing a meet and greet. Yeah. We got book. We got the whole bit. We take photos, everything. Q and A. They mm. can ask me anything they want. So you're here at the moment for three, four days. You're doing Piers Morgan tomorrow and yes. a few others, and then flying back, and then coming back for the tour 
uh, March, mid March fifteenth. It starts right through April fifth, I believe. Brilliant. And how many venues around the country are you doing? Uh, around the uh, around the UK, I think between nine and twelve, nine something 12. like that. They're Fantastic. adding some. They're changing a few, but it's it's coming out good. And tickets are selling, so you better jump on board. Fantastic. Better jump on board. So when you were going in, Nick. What was that feeling like when you walked into prison okay. that first day? Here's what happens, right? I'm 34 years old. The government is mad at me. They're mm. going to give me the business. They finally got me. So they take me to Lewisburg Penitentiary, one of the highest level securities. And at the same time, okay, all of the black guys, the African-Americans, they had uh, revolted in a prison. They burnt it down mm. in Washington, right? So they move all of these guys through the, out the system. So the basement of Lewisburg was condemned. They had to close it down. But now they opened it to put 250 yeah. of these black guys down there, right? So now the government's going to screw me. They take me down to that basement, right? I'm handcuffed. I'm shackled. I'm walking through. And all the guys are going, oh, Whitey, we're going to get you. Blah, 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 and this and that and that. And I go, oh, my God. What am I going to go through here? They don't know who I am, right? As my hand to God, as I'm walking down, they have televisions on the tier, right? And I had just taken my plea. So all of a sudden on there, Michael Francis, $2 billion racketeering, head of the Corombo family, all of that. The guys are looking at me, looking at the TV. Hey, they start cheering me. <laughs> <laughs> they start Quality. cheering me. It was like, thank, thank God. God. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then I had, I had no problem from mm. that point on. But... Um, I never had a problem. No. You know, my father, again, thank God for his wisdom. He said to me, son, when you go to prison, remember these three words. Mm. Please, thank you, excuse me. Yeah. He said, because in prison, the truth, everybody that had, so many guys that never had any respect on the street, they want to prove that there's yeah. something in there. Yeah. So you bunk into somebody, oh, excuse me, yeah. you know, I'm sorry. You want to jump somebody on the line because you got a friend there. Do you mind, please, mm. if, if I get in front of somebody hands you something, thank you. Yeah. You remember those three words, you don't have a problem. In life, let alone in prison. A exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. You got to have prison etiquette too. How rife are drugs in the American prisons? Because in the UK, it's rife, it's everywhere. It, it's, you know, in a federal system, it's not as bad. State, forget it. There's, okay. there's, What's the yeah. difference in federal and the, the state? Federal is run tighter. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you have to do time, you're better doing it in the feds. Yeah. And that's where I did most of mine. I only did uh, maybe about 13 months in the state, but most of my time was in the feds. You, have, you, have, you do better time in the feds mm. than you do in the state. State's rough. With drugs. With drugs, with drugs yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you ever, a moment in time when you were in prison that you had the fear for your life at all? No. From other inmates? Yeah. No. Never had a fear for my life. Um, I, fe I feared the government because yeah. they kept me in solitary for 29 months and seven days. 29 months and seven days. Was that days. two and a half years? Two, yeah, almost three years, yeah. In solitary, give me an example of solitary. As Six by eight cell, 24 seven. That's Not it. Not let out. They're supposed to, by policy, not by law, they're supposed to let you out five hours a week in the yard. And the yard is you're fenced in yeah. and just one person at a time, right? But they don't even do that. They come by at three in the morning, say, hey, it's yard time. I refuse you. Oh, you're refusing? And they write it down because they're lazy, the cops. Mm. But um, yeah, 29 months and seven days. Jeez. That was not easy. No, I'm sure no. not. No. I saw a lot of guys did not do well on that. I saw a lot of bad things go, go mm. down in there because that's torture. Mm. I'm, I'm totally against. I spoke at uh, the, uh, the Senate on uh, one anniversary of the uh, September 11th deal. Mm. And I, we were talking prison reform. And I said, I am dead set against solitary for young people. Yeah. It will destroy them. Yeah. It's, it's mental torture. But I don't know if they'll listen, but uh, it, it was rough. How did, how did you set yourself apart mentally knowing that you're going to be locked up for that amount of time? So a person, of, it was a uh, uh, faith for me. Yeah, okay. Bible and books that my wife sent me in. It was, it was really a faith issue that got me through. That's when I became a Christian Yeah. during my time there. I, uh, I soaked up my Bible. I had my wife send me in several hundred books, all different faiths I was studying. And it was my faith and trust in God that got me through it. Wow. <clears throat> and, and my desire to mm. be with my family again, of course. Got to be determined in that. How long, how long was it when you were in prison? You're going, you know, I, I want to come clean. I want out of this life. 
Was there a certain amount of time when you realized that you need to turn your back on it? Well, no, I, my plan going in, it's yeah. the reason I took the plea. I said, you had enough. Yeah, my plan was this. Because I'm like I said, I'm seeing everybody go down for yeah. all these guys becoming informants and everything else. So my plan was this. I marry my wife. She was 21 years old. And I'll do my time. When I get out of prison, I'll have parole and probation. You can't associate with anybody when you have parole. I'll move out to California, 3,000 miles away. I use it as an excuse. Guys can't meet with anybody. Mm. I can't meet with anybody. And maybe after 10 or 12 years, they forget about me. Mm. That was my plan. Now, it didn't work out because they were, oh, he's walking away from the life, quitting the mafia, the press, Life Magazine wrote a big story. It was all over the news that I was walking away. So everybody thought I was going to become a witness, even my father, because oh. nobody walks away, right? So now a contract on my life, my dad practically disowned me and all this stuff. The feds come in, hey, Francis, you're a dead man anyway. Cooperate oh, with us, right. we'll put you in the program. Words all over the street from your informants, your father turned against you, everything, right? So I'm hearing all of this. So that's in the, they threw me in lockdown as an excuse, right? Trying to get me to break. And then they put me on diesel therapy. You know what that is, no, right? No, what's that? Pick you up in the middle of the night, put you on some plane at the marshal's confiscated off somebody and they take you to another prison right drop you off you're there for a week pick you up take you again to another prison they put you on that it's called diesel therapy yeah. can't get a visit you can hardly get a phone call you're in shackled you're in lockdown all the time so i had several months of that and then they threw me in a hole because they were trying to get me to cooperate and uh, so they really gave me a hard time. Really, Jesus. really gave me a hard time. They get even, trust me. Jesus. When they're talking, they want you to cooperate. How much pressure were they putting on you? A lot. Man. Give an example. Are they, are they trying to just break you down for you just yeah. to go, you know what, have the information, leave me alone? Well, diesel therapy is, it's so bad. You know, it's like I said, you know, I can't even begin to tell you, it, mm. it's just bad. Because you never, you're the not thing in prison, anywhere. you want to get settled. Yeah, right. You, know? you yeah, want to get yeah. your visits, you want to get a phone call, yeah. you want to get, you know, but you can't do any of that. Mm. So it's very hard. And then, and then lockdown is bad, but at least I was able to get visits every once in a while, you know, it, but uh, it, it's tough. I can tell you that. Your wife you married was 21 when you went into prison. Yeah. And you were 20. How old are you? No, I, I'm 12 you're, years older than her. 12, okay. Yeah, so you're so early 30s. Yeah, I was 33. Okay. And she stuck by you the whole 10 years, she boy. Did. Wow. She did. I did eight on a 10, which was maxim, yeah. maximum with good time. She stuck with me. What a woman. The best. <laughs> the best. 21 years old. And you Did you know, have any kids before you went in? I, I, she got, um, just before I went in, she got pregnant. And so I had, <laughs> it's funny. I had one uh, child that was born while I was in prison. Yeah. I got an eight-hour furlough, and she got pregnant again. So I had another. I had one just going into prison, <laughs> one furlough. And then when I was in the halfway house, she, she got pregnant again. So I had, they were all prison babies. Yeah. But, um, and she took care of them, you know. Um, she raised them really for eight years. I mean, it wasn't me. I mean, fortunately, her mother was wonderful. She had brothers that took care of also, but... Yeah, she's she's one in a million. One in a million. Wow. Yeah. What's her name? Camille. Camille. And we're together now. We're married thirty eight years. Massive respect to Camille. Yes. If it wasn't if I don't meet her, hundred percent. Yeah. I'm dead or in prison for the yeah. rest of my life because I wouldn't have walked away. Yeah. Would not have walked did, away. How much how much weight did she have on you to make you go? You know what? Here's the Bible. Go and find. Get out of this life. She she never said get out of the life because no. my wife was born in Anaheim, California. Yeah. There's no mob there. No. We called them the Mickey Mouse mob, the guys in LA. There was no mob there. So she didn't know anything about the life. Mm. So she meets me. I didn't sit down and tell her, oh, by the way, I'm, you know, mm. Cosa Nostra. Never said a word mm. to her, right? I mean, obviously I'm starting to get arrested. She mm. knows what's going on, but I always tell her, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. And then I go to jail. So she didn't know anything, really. She was, you know, naive, mm. you know, and rightfully so. In a nice way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, her mother, too, very strong Christian. And her mother said, you made a commitment to this man. You got to keep it. And mm. so she held her up. My church, when I was away, just took her in, her and my kids. They were so strong. And it's one of the reasons, too, my Christianity means so much because I saw how loving these people were to my wife and kids. Yeah. And they didn't know me. I mean, the pastor of the church, I met him three times. He married me. 
but they rallied around my family and and it, they kept them strong what's the longest amount of time you couldn't see your wife while you're on the diesel oh a couple of months okay yeah a couple of months it was mm. probably three four months i couldn't even get a phone call i mean it was she didn't even know where i was yeah you know they don't tell you and security reason they don't tell you yeah. anything so i mean she really she had a hard time when you came out what year was it I did five years. Yeah. I got out on parole. Yeah. I'm out on parole 13 months, worst 13 months of my life. Why? People looking for me, you know, my father upset with me. The Fed's still trying to, you know, because uh, I'm on parole, yeah. so they still had jurisdiction over me. I'm trying to earn a living out in California. I was like a fish out of water, yeah. you know, trying to bet on the right track, but I'm still a mob guy mentally. Mm. And, uh, and then they violated my parole and put me back in. And they said they were indicting me on another case. They were bringing, they said they were bringing up a murder case on me. I would never come out of prison alive. And, uh, and that's when they threw me in a hole for all those months. But they couldn't indict me on the other case, yeah. but they gave me the maximum amount of parole violation, which was four years. And I did 35 months and 13 days on a mm -hmm. parole. So I'd maxed out on the parole. So I did eight years total. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't an easy eight no. years. Yeah, they, they gave me a hard time. So when you actually came out, did you? how long did you have the fear for? Obviously, you're not going to go straight back to New York. Did you go somewhere to go, you know what, I need to get away from everyone. I'm miles away from everyone. You know, one of the horrors of that life is that you make a mistake. Your best friend walks you into a room. You don't walk out again. And obviously, through my, you know, almost 20 years in that life on the street, I saw that happen. I'm going to be honest with you. So when I walked away, I said, hey, they're not going to walk me into a room. They're going to have to work to get me. Mm -hmm. So I move out to California. I changed my whole lifestyle, meaning what? I didn't create any patterns in my life because I knew they were going to yeah. come look up at me. I didn't create, meaning I didn't walk my dog 7 o'clock every morning. I didn't go to the same restaurant every Tuesday night. I stayed out of clubs. Mm -hmm. Bad place for me. Yeah. I get recognized. Some mm -hmm. guy wants to be a hero to make a call to New York. I walk out in the parking lot. Boom, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. So I, I was very disciplined in changing the patterns of my life. And over a period of time, I just outlasted everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody I know, dead or in prison for the rest of their lives. Everybody. Mm -hmm. And then when they started to realize the feds did me really dirty, what they did, they started putting my name on a witness list of trials that were going on in New York. One of them, the boss of the Jersey family, was my good friend, John Riggie. He was a boss. We were friends. We had a deal together where every window that was put into every uh, building in New York, New York, we, yeah. we got a tariff on. He and I were partners in that. So they indict him, and they have me coming in as a witness. It wasn't oh, true. Really? Oh, my. So now guys are saying, all of these trials are coming. My name is on the witness yeah. list, but I never show up. Then I get violated on my parole. They're saying, this guy, why would they put him back in jail? Yeah. So now I was telling my father, I told you I wasn't going to hurt anybody. So they start to believe that. And then the heat starts to come off. And then who's, they got their own troubles. Yeah. Who's going to jail forever? Mm. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a stat that is pretty mind-boggling. 1986, Fortune magazine writes an article, 50 biggest and most powerful mob bosses. Huge article, half the magazine. Um, they featured six of us. I was one of the six that they featured. They had a chart with the 50 us on there, rank, wealth, power. I was number 18. I was the youngest guy on the list, right? Uh, it was a stupid list. Mm. They didn't ask for our tax returns. Mm. They made it up, right? <laughs> it was yeah, silly. Didn't yeah. mean. You know what's not stupid about that list? Today, out of the list of 50, 48 are dead. Is that right? Number 49 is doing life in prison, and I'm the only one alive and free. Wow. So that goes to show yeah. you the kind of trouble that these guys had. Yeah. Devastating. Mm. So I just kind of hit it right. Is there one mobster that you had the fear of? Well, the one mobster that I'd had, if it would be my boss, mm. because he had life or death over me. You know? What was his and name? And look, Carmine Persico. Yeah. Let me, and, I, and we got along great. He was a guy who said $2 million a week. But when I, when they, Thought that when I walked away, he took it very personal. Yeah, okay. he was. I mean, he was. He was a tough guy. You know? Was he an enforcer as well? Yeah, he yeah. was. A, he was a tough guy. Mm -hmm. Him and my dad were two of the tough guys in that life and uh, in that family, and he took it very personal. Yeah, I mean, and then when he thought I was going to cooperate, yeah. the government was putting it out there. 
Um, if he was on the, he was in jail. He he got a hundred years. Giuliani convicted him on a commission case. If he was out, I don't know if he would have let let it. He would have continued until something happened. But he died in prison. Mm. And his son, who baptized my son, he's dying in prison. So no one, basically, what we're getting here, no one gets out alive, apart from yourself, who's living a really nice life right now. You know, you know. <laughs> To be alive and free yeah. and live publicly and talk about the life like yeah. I have. Now, re remember this. I don't, I don't badmouth anybody mm -hmm. and I don't put people in trouble. Mm -hmm. It was never my thing. I don't feel right about that. It's not what I wanted to do. But I'm very open about mm -hmm. the life. So when I've, you know, social media mm -hmm. exposes the lunacy in the world. Yeah. You, know, I, you know how many threats I've gotten on social media? Have you? Oh, yeah. I mean, it it's, it's, comes with the territory. Okay. But you take it from where it comes on yeah. social media, you know. And one guy's threatening me. So I tell him, I says, why don't you just go to the police station and threaten me? I says, I know everything about you now. Mm -hmm. I got your IP. I know your <laughs> name. I know your Never heard from him again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the fear. Yeah, if somebody's going to come after you, yeah, they're they not going to tell they're you. They're not going to tell you. you. Know, it's no, absolutely. No. So, you know, I, I, I like when they tell mm. me. So how has your world been since coming out of prison then? How many, for, how many kids you got, wife? Your lifestyle now, the way that you've taken social media, the way you got on YouTube, now you're doing a tour in the UK, you become a massive celebrity in the US for speaking up and telling the truth without actually putting anyone down. How's that been for you? Have you enjoyed it? Seven kids, yeah. seven grandkids seven. now. My, my youngest, uh, four months old, was just born. Um, love my wife you know we travel a lot mm -hmm. you know i'm in the wine business friends mm -hmm. east wine you know and we're in where can about, they find, where can people find that hopefully soon in the uk yeah, i got okay. three bottles with me i didn't i got three bottles with me and ella is doing a wonderful job there too we yeah. got yeah we hope to be distributing and and throughout the uk mm -hmm. shortly within the next year right or so down. uh but having great success in the united states um and i'm also in the pizza business we have uh pizza vending machines mm -hmm that are taking the United States by storm. We're in hotels and we're going into casinos in Vegas and all of that. So I have those two things going. My speaking uh, you know, career I've been doing for the last 25 years, you know, they keep, the phone keeps ringing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we've been all over the world. Mm. I was in Australia last year. Um, you know, this year I'll be in Monaco. Um, where else are we going? Uh, gosh, Ella, where am I going, Ella? <laughs> Dubai. Dubai, quality. Yeah, we're going to Dubai and, and a few other places. So, you know, look, God has been very good to me. Mm. Um, I'm very fortunate, very blessed, and we just keep going. You've got some serious energy about you. I can't believe you're 72. You're well, like that, a 50-year-old man in a 30-year-old man's mind. The, like, unbelievable. Well, uh, my, my dad passed away at 103. Yeah. And at 103, he looked like he was about 80, 85. Yeah. Good genes. And, yeah, and, and remember, that's a tough life. Yeah. He did 40 years in prison, so yeah. And my, my, my dad passed away in February of the pandemic, mm. and he was, within three days, he was gone. I don't think, we didn't know about COVID yeah. at that point. I think he was one of the first right victims right. of COVID, yeah, unfortunately. What's it been like also, just before we finish up, you go in on Mike Tyson's hot boxing. <laughs> what was that like, that experience? I mean, I love Mike, yeah. you know, he's, uh, let me tell you about Mike, extremely sincere, mm. very smart, mm. you know, these little nuggets of wisdom that yeah. comes out. He's, he's just, uh, I like the guy a lot. You know, we were, we were, we're doing some things together. He's tough to deal with because mm. he's all over the place, mm. you know, but um, I love Mike. I mean, he's, he's a good guy and he's very sincere and he's turned his life around a big he way, so yeah. What's it like doing a podcast when someone's smoking a joint and you're not? <laughs> well, he, no, he, uh, he, he offered it to me. Yeah. I said, Mike, I'm gonna be the first one that turns it <laughs> down. Don't give me that stuff, right? <laughs> he said, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, he, he, um, he, he's quite often doing Some that. character, isn't he? Oh and, yeah. And also when someone like Donald Trump back in the day, did he have to go through you to buy all properties in New York? He didn't go through us to buy properties, yeah. but to get his buildings done productively and on time, he had to deal with us. Like mm. every other developer, mm. every other developer from Helmsley and Gutterman and all of them, mm. we control the unions. Mm. You wanted to get something done, you play ball. Mm. It was very simple. That's mm. the New York way mm. back then. Mm. You're a proper man's man, right? 
And I can see, what are your thoughts on the way the world has gone now? Do you think it's gone soft? And what are your thoughts on Andrew Tate, the words that he's got to say? I like Andrew. Yeah. Andrew and I communicate. Yeah. I, I like his messaging with respect to making men be men. Yeah. And he's got a huge following of young men that shows you just how much they need a mentor. Yeah. You know, same in the United States, okay? So I like what he stands for in that way. Mm -hmm. I know he can be abrasive at times, mm -hmm. but I think you got to take things in context to what he's saying, you know? Um, I mean, look, I love my wife. Mm -hmm. I, she's, she's better than me as far as I'm concerned. I have five daughters, mm -hmm. you know, that, and they're all very independent, mm -hmm. you know, every single one of them. My wife, very independent. But, you know, what I, what I hate is that when you're telling men to be men, People think you're demeaning yeah, women in some way. But when you're telling men to be men, mm -hmm. you're actually you're benefiting women. Yeah. We each have our role in life, yeah. you know? So, I mean, look, I don't like what they did with Andrew. Yeah. You know, I think I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they lock him up, you know, trying to build a case. Yeah. I understand that. I've been through it so many times, mm -hmm. you know, and I understand what he's saying. And I, again, I, I understand he can be abrasive at times. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with everything he says. Mm -hmm. But I agree with most of what he's mm. trying to do. Mm. Agree, totally agree. Now, what do I think? You, you know, we're going to be here another six hours oh, mate, if I'm we start getting this. into politics. Oh, mate, I'm and loving stuff. all of this. I just want to. <laughs> I just had a. You know, I have a big YouTube platform, yeah. but certain things on YouTube you got to be careful. Yeah. So now I'm on Rumble as of yesterday. Yeah. And what's we, the difference? We, you can speak your mind on. Rumble. Okay. Yeah, and I have a lot to say. You know, listen, my country is falling apart. Yeah. This guy in office. What well, Biden? Oh my God! Yeah. Do you I, think Do you think Trump will get back in? Do you want Trump to get back in? I do. Yeah. Because listen, it's not about personality. You know, I don't care what Trump did with a woman twenty years ago. Yeah. I don't care all this stuff. I want to know what he's doing for my country. His four years as president was very good for our country. His policies were good for our country. Mm -hmm. That's all I care about. Mm -hmm. I'm not into his what he did. I'm not there to judge him yeah. personally like that. I didn't like some of his tweets, and I thought sometimes, Donald, don't yeah. fight with these people. Yeah, yeah. Let them talk and leave it yeah. alone. You know, but I want him to come back. We need somebody to save mm. America. Mm. America's in trouble. Mm. Trust so, me when I tell here. you. Same as the UK. Listen, what's happening, I want to tell you this. Mm. There's, there's two things, and I don't mind saying it with mm. Biden. It's nothing personal. If he was doing a good job, I would say it. Okay, but two things. Number one, I spoke to 850 Border Patrol agents, state of Texas. And they said to me, Michael, we're not even getting 10% of the drugs that are coming in over this country. Not even 10%. Okay? That's number one. Number from two, Mexico. From Mexico. Yeah, well, they're okay. coming, you know, from China's Except, creating yeah. that, going through yeah. Mexico, coming over yeah. the border. He said the gotaways. He said the percentage of gotaways that are getting away is high enough. We don't know how many have gotten away that we don't know about. Yeah. We don't know who these people are. They're coming into our country. They're coming into the city. And listen, my grandparents were immigrants, but they came in there the right way. Yeah. What's going on in that country is crazy. Mm. So I have a real resentment with respect to drugs because killed two people in my family, number one. Number two, my daughter's um, would have been his, her fiance. My daughter's 25 years old now. This kid worked for me, wonderful kid, 24. He did all my video work on YouTube, mm. right? I'm in Chicago speaking. I'm coming back that morning. I'm telling him where he had to go. We were doing something for our pizza thing. He had to go the following morning. So he took an Adderall in my house. He was living in my guest house. Took an Adderall in my house that was laced with fentanyl, dropped dead on the bathroom floor, was dead within seven minutes. Jeez. He was poisoned. Yeah. Now, why am I so resentful? Because if we have 100,000 people dying of, of uh, fentanyl and yeah. opioid overdoses, yeah. you're the president of the United States. You know this is happening mm -hmm. at our border and you're allowing it mm -hmm. to happen. Mob guys on the street wouldn't do that. Yeah. We protected our communities and our neighborhoods. We mm -hmm. would not do that. How could you people have trust in you mm -hmm. to protect us? And mm -hmm. this is what you're allowing? Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, mm. I'm going to say this and no, I'm going to rest. No, I hear you. Gender affirming surgery. Okay? You oh, know what that God, is. Yeah. It's is mutilation that... for young people. Mm. It's mutilation. Look it up. Don't is listen to it. There are like 50 odd genders they're talking about right now. Yeah. But I'm just talking about yeah. young kids changing their gender and going through surgery. Yeah. It's mutilation. It's life changing. You never recover from it. 
we have a president from the White House steps that says banning gender affirming surgery in minors is both outrageous and immoral. Mm. I'm a father of seven yeah, yeah. and a grandchild, a grandfather. Mm. How could you say that? What kind of human being mm -hmm. are you? Mm -hmm. Forget what he does, is doing for the rest of the world. Forget our economy stinks. Forget the fact that he's... <laughs> Listen, how many RICO indictments? I, I said I had uh, s s uh, three RICO indictments. Yeah, yeah. I said I had 18 shell companies. Mm -hmm. He beat me by two. Mm -hmm. They have 20, him and Hunter Biden. Yeah. That's a RICO indictment waiting to happen. Yeah. So, you know, so you're basically could... saying the government are corrupt, right? 100%. Yeah, I hear you. 100%. And mm -hmm. look, I'm on Rumble to say the same. Yeah. And the reason, I'm not I'm not gaining anything by it. But, you know, to those who have been given much, much is expected in return. Mm. I have a platform. And I see my country falling apart. Mm. I mean, the, the people in, the, in L.A., if you want to go get toothpaste, you got to call the people. It's behind the glass because you can come in and steal $950 and walk out of the store. If the security stops you, they get fired. Yeah. So this people are allowed to steal up to 950, 950 with nothing bucks. happening? Nothing. My God. You, you think yeah. I'm making this up? No, no, right? I hear you. It sounds like I a fairy tale. It does sound like a fairy tale. It's like it can never happen. People are robbing in England and getting away with it, just going in, just grabbing all the Nike jackets. Or, no one's going to nick them. There's not enough police on the ground. And if an organized yeah. crime guy smacks somebody in the face, it gets 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we could talk about this for hours. Yes. Absolute hours. Before we finish up here, Tell me where people can find you. Well, they can find me on tour here in the UK pretty yeah, soon. Yeah. Uh, really. Um, and I, I got to say it again. I'm really looking forward to it. And the reason being because of the experience I had when I was here a year ago. Mm. People were so wonderful. And we have so much more to tell this time around. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really hoping that people jump on board here. Um, for all of you in Liverpool, I have to say this. It was the best time. I was a crazy Beatles fan. Yeah. And going into the cave, we had such a blast. It was like, I got to tell you, the cover bands, if you close your eyes, you think yeah, it's you the Beatles. Think, yeah, Have great. you been? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. amazing. I, yeah. I can't wait to get back there. Yeah. But anyway, um, I'm all over YouTube, at Michael Francis. You can get me on Instagram. You can get me on X. Uh, now I'm on Rumble as of yesterday. Yeah. And I think our first video is already like 160,000. Yeah. It grew up there quickly. So I'm glad people are jumping on. And uh, michaelfrancis.com is my mm. website. franciswine.com is the other website. Mm. So I'm, you can find me anywhere. Still still doing loads of stuff, but all legit. All legit. 100% <laughs> It's the only way to go. I've absolutely loved this, Michael. I enjoyed it also. Yeah, mate. I've really enjoyed this. And I thank you for taking your time and doing this podcast with me. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You're a gentleman. Thank you. Good you man. Too. I wish you all the best. Thank you.